let the rest of the class time be yours. Beautiful. Um, do you want questions at the beginning, throughout, at the end? Um, yeah, so, so basically the way I approach talks like this is you can't possibly know what to ask until I've given you context as to who I am. And hopefully through that process, I prove that like I might actually know something and could be useful. Otherwise, there's no reason to ask any questions because I'm just an idiot. But uh, the yeah general process, I want to explain what Piper is. I want to explain a little bit of my story. Um, I have an immense belief that in this model, there's never been a better time to go try to make a dent on the universe, go do something really significant. And while you guys all have a skill set that I would never be able to attain as people pursuing doctorates in what, pharmacy, pharmacy. Uh, we were trying to figure out what that word was, pharmacology, whatever it might be. But um, I, I do have a framework on people that make a real impact, not my framework because Aaron's amazing, but because uh, um, along with that uh, resume the mirror read, I've also hosted a show called Going Deep with Aaron Watson. It's a podcast that's interviewed more than 350 people who are genuinely making a difference, entrepreneurs, founders of nonprofits, political leaders, and spent somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 60 minutes with them, interviewing them on what makes them tick. And so really what I see my role as is number one, my general skills in communication as a storyteller is something that we translate to our clients through Piper Creative. And then also through these experiences, through these interviews that we've done, what we've learned, being able to provide helpful frameworks to other people interested in making an impact. So I'll go all the way to the beginning. I'll kind of give you my spiel. I'll tell you a couple of the philosophies or theories or theses that my work is founded upon. And then what I think everyone here will find the most valuable is if you do have questions, if you do have, you know, this stirs up a thought or how, does it, how might this apply to my world or the thing that I want to work on, we can workshop that. That'll be helpful for everyone because you guys have a lot of context on, a lot more context on where the opportunities are in your world. And if I can be minutely helpful, that would be awesome. But uh, like Amir said, started at the University of Pittsburgh. I was studying economics and poli-sci, but I was actually just playing ultimate frisbee like seven days a week, um, practice, track workouts, all that good stuff. And after I graduated, I had the degree, and I'd like done everything right. I hadn't had the best grades ever, but I graduated in four years, internship, banging resume, like career resource center, all the things you're gonna do. And I, went to the career fair and I was like, these are the options, like this is all there is. And it really was confusing because up to that point, I had been the person who did everything right. I you know, got into the school, got the grades, blah, blah, blah. And so what that set off, what that was a catalyst for was an exploration of who are the people who are really up to the interesting work? Who are the people that are doing the interesting things? And how can I piece apart their story so that I can take a little bit of that for myself? That took the form of the podcast, Going Deeper There in Watson. And like I said, it was really an excuse to not only just help me learn the way that I learn, um, but get in the room with these people and also start to build relationships with them because amongst the many truisms or, or pieces of advice that just get handed out over and over and again that are really true, your network does really, really matter. It opens doors for you, uh, whether that's sponsors for our event, the Going Deep Summit, whether that's the first four clients that the day we turned on the lights at Piper and let everyone know that we were up to this called us and were like, hey, I want to work with you guys. Like, that's the type of thing when you're starting a business to have your clients immediately reach out to you and say, hey, I want to work with you is something that a lot of people aspire to. And also beyond that scope of like practical business, exchanging dollars, making transactions, the people who attended the summit, the people who listened to the podcast, the people who generally give a shit what it is that we do, give a shit because of those episodes that we put out in the world, the, the stories that we've collected that you can't necessarily find elsewhere. There's plenty of podcasts, there's plenty of other shows, there's plenty of other interview programs, and there aren't many that feature these change makers primarily in the city of Pittsburgh. The last 200 episodes or so have basically all been people in Pittsburgh making a difference, and we hear a couple common refrains. Wow, I didn't know there was so much talent here. Wow, I didn't know uh, that someone was even trying this. Like, I'm so happy to hear that uh, Kevin Souza is opening a restaurant in Braddock that hasn't had a restaurant that open, that can serve a hot meal 
in that neighborhood for more than 30 years. The first restaurant in more than 30 years, a uh, neighborhood that's been decimated by poverty, by steel moving out of the city of Pittsburgh, can start to change that narrative, uh, giving discounted meals to Braddock residents, and is now something that people come to Pittsburgh to go experience Superior Motors, his restaurant. There's countless stories like that, and being able to trade in those stories is something that um, I really appreciate, and over the course of the 300 plus episodes that we've done, a couple interesting things have happened. We've started to figure out how the media landscape is shifting. Um, th there's a lot of classic examples that are just like completely obvious that you know, no one watches TV commercials anymore and who listens to you know, terrestrial radio and, and things like this, but it actually gets much more nuanced in terms of what types of media actually resonate with people and how these communication skills are absolutely essential for any new venture to happen. Unless you are literally in the most technical, opaque, uh, inaccessible arena, maybe, maybe you're Palantir and you're selling security to the government and it's one client makes up your entire roster, outside of that environment, you have to be a good storyteller. You have to get people to care about the thing that you're working on. You have to get them to understand why it's valuable to them, why it will make sense in their story, even, even the way I introduced myself. I didn't introduce myself as, man, Aaron's cool, like you guys are gonna love Aaron. I positioned my story as hopefully I can provide one morsel, one unlock for you in your journey because that's how you're processing the world. And that's the type of framework that someone who's starting a business, someone who's running a business, someone who is an expert in one field doesn't necessarily understand their messaging has to be tailored to that frame of mind. Um, the way Piper works is we've been in business for a little over a year. We have three core service offerings. What we do for our clients is we provide the creative muscle, the creative infrastructure for their brand. So they don't know how to operate a podcast. They don't know the equipment they need. They don't know how to edit the audio. They don't know when to publish. They don't know all these like technical nuances that really aren't important for what they do. They might be a high level lawyer. They might be a marketing executive for the last 15 years. They might be someone who's trying to redefine how psychiatric care is delivered to patients. They don't need to know that, but they need it done so that they can more effectively message to the people that are uh, gonna make all the difference in their business. So we come in, we execute that for them. They show up, they speak into the mic, they're the expert and get that distribution without having to worry about that creative mess in the middle. Similarly, we do the same thing on LinkedIn where we'll come in for a once again, a very busy executive who doesn't have a lot of time and in a two hour session, often less than two hours, but in a two hour session, we'll set up the camera the executive will sit across from the camera or stand and talk about 10 things in like a one to three minute increment that are on their mind, that are maybe part of their values, maybe part of their philosophy about how the world works. And then we take that raw footage, slice it and dice it, edit it, uh, schedule it all out. And in that less than two hour session, that person now has a month's worth of content that they can distribute to LinkedIn, to some of these other platforms, and have a video marketing presence to their business. The last and kind of the biggest pie in the sky thing that really we're, we might even still be a little bit early on is the concept of documentary as a service, or if some of you watch YouTube, a vlog. That's what we're shooting right now. Hannah's working the two cameras. We've produced 115 episodes of our own vlog. That's been cut into smaller slices so that it could be distributed on these different social platforms. And it's the basic idea that there there's the like traditional YouTuber where they're sitting in their bedroom and they're like, today I, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And their whole gig is being at one with that camera. In reality, back to these executives being very busy, having a lot of things on their mind, they don't have the time to do that. They don't have the mental bandwidth to allocate even another two hours per week to producing that vlog, even if someone else was responsible for it. So we'll come in and we'll shoot the whole thing. If you have a big event, We'll come in, we'll cover the event, make more people wanna go next year. If you have a big moment in your company, we just raised our Series A, we just brought on 10 new people, we just um, tried to redefine our company culture, we can come in and document that on your behalf, be your storytellers on demand, and you can then publish that and have something to point to because what happens often is, yo, know, we care about company culture, we're team players, we, we're like a family here. It's all buzzwords, it's all people, you know, talking their book, they try to tell you what you want to hear, it really matters when you can show someone.
What we do when we bring on, we call our interns creative apprentices, when we bring on our creative apprentices for a new semester, we show them a video that is literally just the last four creative apprentices talking about their experience, unedited. And there's no way that we could fake that. Like if the, like if the person was like, yeah, so for academic credit, I have to talk to the camera. Cool. And then, and then they just came with no energy. That would, that would be conveyed in video. You can't fake it, right? So those type of ideas are Piper's core assumption. The way that Piper came to be was once again through the podcast. All these things are completely interconnected. Um, we interviewed, a, or I'm sorry, I interviewed uh, someone who is running a college alternative program where you could go directly into the world, uh, skip college, get real world experience, work in a small business. And through producing that episode, I met Hannah. Hannah is now my co-founder. She's the chief creative officer of Piper. I'm the chief executive officer. And that was more than two years before the founding of the company. But it would not have been possible had I not been creating that content. She listened to the podcast, got into the program, got real world experience, and is now a 21-year-old co-founder of a company. She is able to sell uh, fine art through her Instagram account, something that's just like not even a model that you could have explained to someone 10 years ago. And because we have this fluency, we're also in a market in Pittsburgh where people are you know, a little behind the eight ball when it comes to modern advertising and media. If you're right in downtown Manhattan in New York, if you're right in LA, then like some of this stuff is like so obvious, it's like you're beating me over the head with it. But in most other markets, there's still a lot of people catching up they don't know what search engine optimization is. They don't even know how to upload a video to a social platform. And these are people with hundreds of thousands in annual revenue for their business. So that's the type of fluency and the skill set that we come in and deliver to clients. But it's also tied to a larger brand that we're building for ourselves. The kind of core thesis that Piper is built on is that if you build an audience of like-minded individuals, these could be aspirational wannabe entrepreneurs and game changers, or it could be beer drinking sports fans, or it could be people who love dressing in the color yellow. It could be any audience that you could imagine, but if you cultivate that audience, you actually open the door for much more business to be built on top of that audience. One of the kind of themes right now in the world of venture capital, in the world of consumer packaged goods, is the notion that for every dollar that a venture capitalist invests into one of these companies, one of these startups, 40 cents is going directly to Facebook or to Google. That's because there is such an arms race to acquire new customers that every single brand has to allocate a majority of the money that they raise just to acquiring new clients through those different platforms. If you kind of take that to a logical conclusion, that's not sustainable. Eventually, the money burns up, there's, there's no more customers to acquire, and you kind of fall flat on your face. And then the companies that have successfully acquired an audience, not just transactions, but once again, a brand where your I'm sorry, a brand where you matter to customers, where people care what you're up to, then you can come back to that audience and let's say it's the yellow, the yellow dressers. Okay, you bought yellow pants, we've got a new yellow hat for sale. What do you think? We've already, we already know they like yellow. That's a little bit of a gross oversimplification, but you can see where once you have that audience that you know what they like and you know what they're into and you start to understand them because you've been messaging them to two, three, four consecutive years, then you, you've earned the right to bring that next thing to market with them. Um, that's part of the thesis of Piper. The Going Deep Summit that uh, Amir mentioned and that I believe he gave you guys some codes for is also built off of that same idea. So how do you test that you actually have an audience that cares about you versus just an audience? Because there's people with thousands of Instagram followers and if they said, buy my book, they would get zero book sales, right? Because it's not why they're following the Instagram account. The way that we decided to prove that we had an audience that cared was through hosting this event called the Going Deep Summit. The first one was in January of 2018. Second one was nine days ago, 10 days ago. And the idea there was that through all these interviews, we've found all these people up to really interesting stuff. There's a couple that are particular, particularly articulate. Wow, that was a tongue twister. Um, particularly articulate, 
really onto something big, onto something interesting. And we want to share that with people. We want to give that more of a platform. But also, we get some street cred by being the first people to put them on. So for example, the opening keynote of the first Going Deep Summit is by a guy named Ed Lattimore. Ed grew up in poverty. He became a heavyweight boxer, went seven and one, and now he writes books. He has a degree in physics. He's incredibly articulate, incredibly talented, and I think in the last year he's added something like 60, 70,000 followers on Twitter, and he really like hits the core of some interesting ideas. He had never really done a public speaking uh, event before, except for one time out in Colorado where they recorded the video and then didn't even like publish the video after he had spoken. We got the video up from his talk at the Going Deep Summit within 48 hours after having done the talk. It's now the most viewed video about him on YouTube other than the time that he literally got knocked out on, uh, in a heavyweight bout. That's what he talked about on stage, and that's the type of thing where he can piece that apart very articulately. I thought I was the man, I was 7-0, biggest fight of my life, and then I slipped in the, in, the, in the ring. And I got back up, and I slipped again. He didn't slip, he got hit in the face, and didn't even register that he had been hit in the face because he was hit so hard. But he spoke about putting his psyche back together after you think you're the baddest man on the planet, 7-0, to have yourself be knocked out in the biggest fight of your life and how that changes your understanding of yourself, how that gives you, how you use that to either become more diligent, more tenacious, more persistent, or less. And that's the type of universal message that we can share with the nonprofit founder, the entrepreneur, the person that's gonna be the intrapreneur in the large organization trying to make all the difference. Um, those are the type of stories that we wanna share at those events and then it starts to feed on itself where A players who go to an event like that have a good time, and then their other buddies who are A players are like, what was that event all about? You need to come the next year. And we start to cultivate that audience, cultivate that audience, cultivate that audience. Um, I can keep going on some of the theses, but I've spoken very quickly for an extended period of time now, and I want to check in to see if there are any questions. So I, I have a bunch, but I can get started with one at least. Bring it, yeah. So where does, where does this go in 12 months at your current trajectory? Because you're at the beginning, so every month changes what the future looks like currently. Yeah. Where does it look like 12 months from now? So I'll answer that, but kind of diverge for a second. So we were actually just talking about this literally before we came up here. We have exposed ourselves in the last year to a higher degree of variability than any other point in our lives. What that means is, immense highs and brutal, brutal lows. What that looks like is something where, um, to make up some numbers, multiple tens of thousands of dollars that you're expecting to hit the bank this month and a couple invoices don't get paid on time and all of a sudden you're in a cash flow scare where you're not sure if you can pay your director of operations and your vendors because a couple of your clients just haven't paid on time. So it doesn't mean they're not gonna pay, but that's an immensely stressful 48 hours to live through. So those are immense lows. Then there's the immense highs of the day after the summit, getting a message from a kid who says, I feel like I completely learned something new about myself. I'm so excited for the next Going Deep Summit, and I feel like you've probably changed my life. So we're experiencing immense highs and lows, which also makes prediction with any sort of concreteness incredibly, incredibly difficult. We're probably going to do as much revenue in March and April as we did in all of 2018, probably. But there was no way I could have even predicted that in January. So I'm experiencing an immense amount of variability, which is part and parcel for what it's like to be building something from scratch. One of the most impactful interviews that I've ever done is with a guy named Ian Rosenberger, who founded a company called Thread International. He experienced the Haitian earthquake. He actually went down and tried to help when the Haitian earthquake happened and recognized, he actually wrote in his journal, he said, if Haiti could turn garbage into gold, they'd be rich. Because all he saw was just garbage everywhere. What that manifested into over the last decade has been a company that went from starting with turning plastic bottles into Thread, hence the name Thread International. Then 
they, uh, they hit the next level where they'd sell that thread to other companies that would turn it into fabric. Then they turn the thread into fabric and they would sell that fabric to companies like Timbaland, like Reebok, but they need help from an outside vendor to actually make that happen. Now, just recently, they raised more than a half a million dollars in a Kickstarter campaign to sell a backpack where they're training people in Homestead to stitch these bags together and you can now wear a backpack made by Thread International that they've taken the whole um, supply chain from garbage in Haiti to thread to fabric to backpack, right? We started off the conversation in the podcast, it's all about grit. There were so many times where Ian's back was against the wall and he just had to keep the lights on. I tell that story in reverse now over the decade, it's like, wow, what an amazing story, what a journey. That's something I could package and sell, it could probably be a movie. But in reality, there were days where you didn't know if they were gonna keep going. They didn't know if the next round of fundraising would come in. They didn't know if enough sales would come in, or if that client would close, or if their invoice would get paid on time. So to answer your question of where we're going in the next 12 months, we're gonna do another Going Deep Summit. It's gonna be in 2020. It's gonna be awesome. All of you should come. Um, and we're also going to continue to build out our company so that we have a stable of creatives. Stable in the sense of like horses, but we treat our creatives better than horses. Um, those creatives are going to be deployed both against our client work, so the podcasts, the, the videos um, that we do on behalf of our clients, but also against Piper. So what we've what we're building is an engine where we can take people with very, very limited training. To explain what that means, um, we have a, a young woman from Point Park who is a creative apprentice with us, and after one of our sessions, she said, I just learned more in 15 minutes about editing audio than I did in my entire semester in class. So, so we're developing a way to transfer this information because we need more creatives. As we get more clients, there's just more work to be done, but also as we're building the Piper Creative brand and Hannah gets busier and busier and we get to a point where th this video that we're shooting needs to be turned into two to three clips for LinkedIn, it needs to be turned into an IGTV video, it needs to be turned into a full length video for YouTube. The audio needs to be stripped out so that we can create a podcast episode. There needs to be an Instagram story teasing the YouTube video that just went up. You can see how this grows and grows and grows. We need someone with the fluency to be able to do that and do it efficiently. Because one of the mistakes someone will make is, okay, you're the vlogger, you're gonna set up the cameras, you're gonna do the uh, vlog of the day, and then someone else is gonna cut out the LinkedIn stuff, and someone else is gonna cut out the Instagram stuff, and you have a massive inefficiency where you have three different people trying to consume the whole hour-long ramble that Aaron went on, and they get bored, they lose focus, they're trying to find their pieces, versus someone who can seamlessly go through the whole thing in a day. So we're trying to become more efficient as a company. We need our prices to be competitive, but we also need to stay on the cutting edge. IGTV didn't matter even a year ago, and now it is the most prevalent thing that you can post on the, on the Instagram algorithm. So we also have to be actively staying on the pulse of what works. Right now, LinkedIn video really works. We've gotten more than half of our clients through posting LinkedIn video. We've gotten connected to some of the biggest business executives in the city of Pittsburgh through LinkedIn video, and so we're, we sell our own dog food. We're not selling this to clients because we think it's gonna work. It has worked for us, and so we're gonna pass that along to the people who hire us, but those kind of processes are how we think about the next 12 months. We don't have a specific revenue goal. We don't have a specific numeric goal because basically even like 12 months, I'm not very good at darts. Like that feels like trying to hit a bullseye on a dart across the, on a board across the room. I just don't have the equipment to do that, but I know if our processes are right, we will get where we need to go. Any questions? I have one more. What's your current team look like? So we have eight creative apprentices, seven? Seven, seven. We have seven creative apprentices. We have a director of operations. We are bringing a new videographer on board full time in the next month. Um, but Hannah and I take up a majority of the client work right now. Here's a question just for everyone else's thought. Um, how did you start? Like if you put yourself in their seats right now, this is a set of students that I think might, are most likely out of the pharmacy school to consider 
I want to do something kind of yeah. entrepreneurial. Where do you start? Because you started with the podcast, it sounds like. Right. So why? So, so I didn't, so like there's a couple important notes on that front. Number one, if you had saw me on the street after the first 10 episodes of the podcast and been like, when's the summit? When's Piper Creative happening? I've had no idea what you're talking about. Absolutely no plan of that whatsoever. Both of those things became apparent to me after having taken multiple steps. I need to take the step of, okay, am I gonna continue with a podcast? Okay, how do I become better as a podcaster? Okay, now that there's an audience, what do I do? What, what do I deliver to them that's of value to them? And that's when the summit emerged. And then once I was able to get 180 people into a venue to watch a thing that I just came up with in my head and made the invites for, I was like, oh, I can actually drive people to action with this digital media. I can sell that to clients hence Piper Creative. So both of those things kind of emerged to me or presented themselves to me as I moved down the path. But it started with the podcast. And I can tell you, I have it seared in my memory, when I told my parents that I was gonna start a podcast and quit my financial services job, their jaws hit the floor and they were like, you could just see them coming up with reasons why that was a bad idea, no. Like they didn't even understand what a podcast was, but they just thought that was a complete load of shit. So the core of that is the confidence in yourself, the trust of your own gut, to go make the move that feels right to you. Because there will be no point, like no one that we pitched Piper to day one was like, oh, I completely get it. I see why you guys are doing it. It's like, what, huh? I'm a lot better at explaining it now than I used to be. At first, I kind of had the, the idea in my head, but I couldn't really articulate it. Even with, with Hannah, I said, we're gonna be a company where we produce vlogs for other companies and we're gonna vlog ourselves along the way. That's all I had. But she got it. And I knew she'd get it because we'd interacted multiple times and I knew that she kind of consumed some of the same channels and, and thinkers that I did. So I knew that we were kind of on the same wavelength, but I didn't know for sure that she would get it. I thought maybe I was crazy. And that's, that's something you have to learn to be able to deal with, is that doubt, that, that I'm not sure and that's okay, because I can relate to, well, you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna do this well, and that means you're gonna get to here, and then you're gonna do this well, and that well, and that means you're gonna get to here, and you can see all the steps laid out in front of you. That's, that's the thing that my mom and dad would've given me the green light for. They thought when I was studying Econ and Poli Sci that I was gonna be a lawyer. Get to law school, become a lawyer, I can see the path, booyah. My dad didn't even come to the first summit. He came for the last 20 minutes. That didn't make me feel good. But he came, sat there for the whole time this year, starts to understand what I'm doing. But like, you can't do it for them. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go do something different, it has to be for you. And the answer is gonna come from your gut. It's gonna come from like all those, back to those things that like you hear and it's like, it's true, but it's hard to really believe in. It's like trusting your nose, trusting your gut a sense, this is gonna work. I need to try this. Is there a quality or knowledge that younger generation, younger generation has, like our age and here, that makes us, that is good for us to have when we enter the working world versus um, not as older generation? So, so there's, there's a meta pattern of we grew up with digital everything and it doesn't make sense when we run into something that's outdated. So what that means is um, the first digital products that were really you know, responsive and had a great UI and a great UX were consumer facing things like Facebook, like Snapchat, like Instagram. They were made to be easy to use because they had to be usable by billions of consumers. But you walk into a large organization and they have some enterprise software from like the 80s and it's not user friendly. It is completely opaque, it is really difficult to understand. And instead of having become accustomed to that, or you know, like, you know the analogy of the frog in boiling water? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? No? There's, there's a notion, I don't even know if this is like actually accurate, but it's like, if you put a frog in water and you slowly raise the temperature up to boiling, it won't jump out. But if you like try to drop a frog in boiling water that's already boiling, it'll jump right out. So if you've worked in industry through the 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, teens, you don't notice the pain of like that outdated software or that outdated product or that outdated process because it's like always been that way. It's just like 
I mean, that's how it's done. So the advantage that you have as the new person is you, you, you will have a much more visceral reaction to the things that are like, this, this is brutal, like this is awful. And there's some things that you have to come to figure out, it's through experience, like there's a reason why we do this, but then there's also that chafing against, well, we shouldn't just do it because that's the way it's always been done. So that's something that anyone in this room has the ability to understand. And then I think the other aspect of it is, if you have the right frame of mind, you can endure more hardship right now. Like people know the idea of lifestyle inflation. One nod. If, if not, it's not a big deal, I'll explain it. Lifestyle inflation is the idea that like, okay, your entry level job, you make, let's call it 50,000. And then over the next five years, you get up to 75,000. And then over the next decade, you get up to 110. And then once you're at 110 and you have like the nicer house and the nicer car and the better clothes, you like become accustomed to that. And going back down to the lifestyle that you had 15 years ago when you were making 50 is just awful. It's terrible. However, you're a student right now. Like it, you're not, I mean, maybe you've got like some wealthy parents, which is cool, but like you're probably not balling. And that capacity to endure hardship is really crucial. Like me kind of, it seems like a flex when I say that our revenues going up by so much from last year, but like that money isn't translated into Hannah's and my bank accounts. That money is being translated into, do we have enough that I can comfortably offer someone else a job and not lose hours of sleep over it because I'm not sure if we can pay them in June, right? That's the kind of like modeling that I'm doing and it's not, you know, we just got a new client, that means Aaron gets some new swaggy shoes. That means we got a new client. That means we get some new gear. We get to spend more on Facebook advertising. And that capacity to endure hardship is going to allow you to take those roads that maybe other people can see, but they'll be like, you know, someone should change that. Someone should do that. But like that path that they're kind of talking about, the reason they're not like, I'm gonna go do that is because that means I don't get to go eat out at the nice restaurant. I have to eat Pizza Hut for the next three years. Or more. I want you to think about the projects that you guys are working on and sort of the roadblocks that you might be hitting. Because with Aaron, you have someone who's hit the roadblocks and gone past them. And so those are the questions that are best for you. It's like, here's where I'm at now. What, do you, what would you do if you were in my seat? So think about the projects that you're doing. A big emphasis in this class is kind of uh, don't stop, so it's like iterations, you know, it, even if it's bad. At this moment, you just have to keep going. Have you ever gotten to a point where, in the very beginning, or maybe even now, like where you hit that roadblock where you just stopped working on it and then you had to get back into it, or did you just always kind of go up and up? I definitely didn't just go up and up. Um, <laughs> So there are multiple times that like I can remember where, and I don't know if this is necessarily answer the question, but I was like looking at the download numbers associated with the podcast and it was just like, why isn't this working? Why aren't people listening? Why aren't people enjoying the thing that I'm making? And it did take iterations. Like if you listen to the old version to the new version, it's night and day. It's like a, a steaming turd to slightly less of a steaming turd. And so that is going to happen. That's inevitably going to be a part of the process. I don't have a good mental model or a framework for like when you cut your losses versus when you persist on. I just kind of have a bias for persisting on. It's probably something that I learned from sports of like, okay, like that track, work didn't, track workout didn't go so well, come back in three days and do it again. So like I, I don't really have that like I just allowed myself to quit, I, I guess. Like that was kind of like also how I, was how I was parented. Like I wasn't allowed to quit the Boy Scouts. I wasn't allowed to quit soccer. I wasn't allowed to quit anything even if I kind of said I wanted to one day. And so that, that's just basically the only way I know how to operate. When did you leave your job to start this? So, you started or so, so it was, transition, or it was uh, transition from the financial services to VP of sales at Top Score. VP of sales at Top Score was okay, I'm gonna work in this startup, I'm gonna you know, learn about the scaling, like there were eight people at that point, no, 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 six people at that point in time, and I'm gonna learn what startup life is like, maybe this will be a cool thing, but like at least I'm learning, and they know from day one that I'm also producing this podcast. Like there's gonna be days where I'm out, 
because I'm interviewing Bill Smith. Then it moved into um, moving out of top score and having different effectively freelance marketing roles. And what that means is there were different kind of odds and ends tasked that certain odds and ends that were tasks that other firms needed done. So they handed off to me. I had proven my capability by being able to point to the podcast and show what I had done, but it wasn't in any way systematized or really what I was trying to get to, which was a productized service. I was able to very clearly articulate the three services that Piper offers. And because I can articulate those so clearly, that also represents how much of a process it is and how systematized it is so that I can train someone else to do it, which allows us to scale. What happens in a lot of other firms is you kind of get stuck. It's like the one person show and we need you to do this thing, we need you to do this thing, we need you to do this thing and that's just a constraint that you can't change the hours in the day. So it was a piecemeal process from okay, start up and like this on the side to freelancer, like a lot of flexibility, definitely not a lot of pay, but like no real systems either to, okay, this business is going to be a system. There's a very clear delineation between mine and Hannah's responsibilities, finance, admin, sales, rambling in front of strangers, shooting video, doing all sorts of amazing uh, visual media and the like. So we, you know, just in that, de that delineation, start to have a system. And then when I build that stable of creatives out, I can now plug other people into these processes because there's aspects of Hannah's job that she doesn't love that we have to do because startup life. And now we can plug other people into that who also get the opportunity to learn similar to me at top score who might be on their own journey or they just want to build their skill set. How do you recommend networking when you're just kind of starting out and you don't have the name recognition or the leverage or the power that someone above you has? So one of the biggest kind of mental switches that you can flip is if you really don't have an agenda, and when I say don't have an agenda, like I need to sell this person something, I need them to hire me. If you legitimately don't have an agenda, there are immense, an immense array of opportunities to bring people in to be your coach, your mentor, explicitly or implicitly. Especially when you're a student right now, there are so many people that if you, if you sent a cold email to and said, hi, I'm Fred, I am a doctorate student in pharmacy at the University of Pittsburgh, and I am really curious about X. Can I get coffee with you and ask you a little bit about the industry? Like that's, that's actually harder for other people who've been through the trenches a little bit more to do because as soon as someone says, oh, they're in sales, like, oh, no, I'm not going like, to spend my time with that person. But if you're an earnest student looking for some perspective, it doesn't mean you're going to have a 100% hit rate, but it doesn't cost anything to send an email. And if you send that email saying, hey, can I like, ask you some questions about how this works, you can very quickly not only build a network, but build a more thorough understanding of how the industry that you want to break into works. So that's one element of it. The other element of it is to go places with intention. So I actually, we have a, we have a friend named Zach who has a pretty uh, solid piece of advice, which is don't just like go to networking events. Like don't go, what that means is don't go to networking events with like no agenda and you have no idea who's going to be there. And like really it's people just kind of throwing their business cards around like this. Go to places where it's very clear who will be there, what type of characters will be there, and maybe if there's like an industry specific element to it. And then just go in and be an earnest human being. Be someone who's like, I'm curious about this stuff, can you help me? I'm really curious about you, can you tell me more about yourself? It, it, it's like back to those things that are obvious but are not necessarily, um, you know, you, you hear it and you're like, well, is this just like a truism or is this actually effective? It's really effective. Like the reason I have a network in Pittsburgh is because I went around to 300 people and asked them questions for a half hour. It was under the guise of the podcast. It's a little bit easier to sell someone on talking about themselves when you're like, hey, I'll record you talking about yourself and I'll, and I'll share it with other people. Like that, that makes the pitch a little bit easier. But if you just earnestly want to learn from people and you're willing to do the work of going out and asking, it'll happen. What do you look for in your career? Is there like other employees? Because it's very non-professional. Self-starters. Self-starters is the number one thing. You can just leave it off. It's okay. You don't have to worry about it. Um, people know that it's Piper Creative. Um, so 
we just uh, had a, someone accept a role for the summer and she taught herself Photoshop over a three to four week period. It's very easy to do. You can go to YouTube, how to do Photoshop. Watch three hours of videos, try it out, get stuck somewhere. How to, what's like something people get stuck on in Photoshop? How to set your ratio crop size. How to set your ratio crop size on Photoshop. Watch a video and you, and you can teach yourself, but a lot of people don't do that. It's, it's actually, we've had some people who come in and they're like, oh yeah, I couldn't figure out how to do it, so I didn't. It's like, well, like, do I have to just tell you, like, go look it up? Like, what, like, what do I have to do here? So, and that's really hard to evaluate for. That's something that, like, if we kind of find a story of that during the interview process, that helps. But that is the biggest thing because all of it's teachable. Like, literally, we want people who are friendly, are kind, are thoughtful, are self-starters. We can teach the rest. We had, we, had a, we had a kid who literally took... So we, when we t I talk about like the long video and pulling out a section for LinkedIn, we call that micro content. He literally took an entire week to produce one piece of micro content his first week. He was like, I got stuck on this one thing, it was like four hours. He figured it out, like he, he did the work, but it took him an hour to do that. Now, in a single week, he can come with me to a podcast, shoot the entire thing, produce the full length video for YouTube, create multiple pieces of micro content for multiple platforms, and then come back and ask for more before the week's over. But that's just through our iterative process of, okay, you did this, here's feedback, here's how you do more, here's how it all fits together. We can teach that, we're not worried about that. Frankly, someone who can do all of that already is probably too expensive for us. <laughs> So like you guys help other people, other businesses market, but how are you currently marketing like your business to your potential customers? We put out more content about ourselves than any firm our size, maybe anywhere, but certainly in Pittsburgh. So we put out a weekly podcast. We put out at least one video per day on LinkedIn. We put uh, regular content on content out on Instagram. We have a monthly newsletter. We have at least three videos per week go up on YouTube. We have tweets being Twittered. Um, we have countless meetings that are a byproduct partially of the content that we put out. And all of that goes into differentiating ourselves. So like I'll give you, a, uh, this person isn't a client yet, but we saw him at a networking event for founders in the city. And he says, every time I open LinkedIn, I see your face. And he says it with like a smile because it's like, it's actually a differentiated experience. He's like, I really like the way you guys do content. And not just that it's there, but he's like, he's watching it, clearly giving it likes. That's why it's the first thing he sees. And you know, we need some content like that for our startup, maybe just like a five video series on uh, our, uh, try not to give away any, pertinent info. Um, we need some videos like that. Can we have a meeting and talk about it? So that's like, that's like the dot being connected. It's not like, I see a video, here's money. There's like a little bit more to the process, but that is the entry point where we don't have to like show a portfolio of our work because people have been consuming it. Uh, for there's Facebook Pixel and then LinkedIn Tracker. Yes. Do they give you enough data all the way down to the individual user? Or no, like if you had 150 people watch a certain video, do you know who they are? Does it, or does it just give you the lowest level details, the title? They do, not they do not go all the way down to the individual. So I'll explain what that is. Facebook pixel, LinkedIn tracker, thumbs up, thumbs down, I don't know what that means. Let's get interactive, come on. So Facebook pixel and LinkedIn tracker are something that goes on a website and you can all download an extension called the Facebook Pixel Tracker on your Google Chrome browser and you can see which websites are tracking you. It's pretty cool. Um, but they will tag you and tag your Facebook profile so that the next time you open up Facebook or Instagram and you came to my dog sweater website, you're going to see an ad for a dog sweater. That's how they do it because they have that info there and they're paying for ads to be shown to the people who are tagged by a, someone who visited your website. There's other ways to add people to that, but that's like the standard way that it works. It does not go down to the individual, but it gets hyper, hyper targeted to the point where um, what you can do, one of the most effective things you can do is, okay, we have these 
500 people who all bought our dog sweater and we want to find more people who want to buy dog sweaters. So let's put their 500 emails, because we've collected their emails through the PayPal process or however, however they checked out. We plug their 500 emails into Facebook. It filters out the 13 who got really mad and shut down their Instagram and Facebook accounts. And for the other 487, they make a look-alike audience. And it's all the people who like the same channels, who have the same demographic background, the same estimated so socioeconomic status, and they target your dog sweater ads to those people. I imagine, I imagine some like larger firms, like UPMC for example, I imagine they do a lot of in-house media. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if, if you're even interested in larger companies, if that's something that like, more down the road or if you struggle to reach through them. We have one Fortune 500 company who we produce their internal podcast for, and that's really a company culture building mechanism. So what are the executives initiatives? How does that actually work as a rollout throughout the entirety of our organization? It's not something that we're opposed to. They can cut bigger checks. Uh, they move a little bit more slowly. So it's not like a we have a preference one way or another. I think long term, you're going to see all of these firms start to produce vlogs of their own, and we'd like to be the providers of those. The reality is, is that most of those aren't early adopters. Like UPMC is not gonna be the early adopter of the company vlog. They're gonna be maybe a fast follower, more likely the middle of the pack. So um, I took up Mir's offer to go to Going Deep Summit. I uh, really enjoyed it. Do you have any other events similar to that throughout the year? Is that like your, is that your, like your year of event? We have an event in the middle of the summer called Epic Privateer that is an art show. Um, and then we will have a specific LinkedIn workshop this summer that does not have a date. What's the date for Epic Privateer? July 19th. July 19th. And we also have an event called the Connection You Meetup, uh, which is a Facebook group called Connection You. It's a free meetup, like once a quarter, and it's trying to change the culture around these networking events where people aren't just passing out business cards and doing those things that we alluded to not being productive, uh, but are just you know humans trying to connect with other humans. So if anyone wants to join that Facebook group, uh, pester Amir and I'll make him help you. No, it's not public. Um, it's public. It's yeah, it should be searchable. Any other questions? I can ramble. I'm good at rambling. Did you need um, significant money to start? No. Nope. Um, there are companies where it, you just absolutely have to raise funding to get started. Um, there are companies, I mean, that's also back to the point that I made with him of like, are you willing to like live at a lower standard and like tough it out for a while? Um, but the nature of our business is an agency at its core. If you ever hear that a company is an agency, what that means is that they are deploying people against a problem for someone else. So uh, an age, a sports agent, is someone that the athlete deploys against contract negotiations with the team on their behalf, because they don't know how to do it, they don't want to do it, and for that, the agent gets a cut. Similarly, in our world, the people that hire us want to deploy our humans, our creative talent, our apprentices, against the problem of producing this media. We, we charge a fee for that. So that business model lends itself to not having particularly high fixed costs, like you might to get an FDA approval, or you might to get uh, minimum vi viable product technology off the ground. That's just a conscious choice that we made because we didn't want to share ownership of the company or lose control of the company in any way, shape, or form. We're young, we don't have a lot of dough, but we can get started and we can maintain our sovereignty over the direction of Piper forever. Until we die and then we pass it off to our kids. <laughs> Any closing questions? Every single entrepreneur 
that I've interviewed had no idea what their thing would turn into when they started. And that's not like everyone in this room needs to be an entrepreneur, but it is okay to have that degree of uncertainty about what comes next. That's also just like philosophically how life is gonna work. But if you're really trying to like go make that dent in the universe in whatever area may be, that is something that you fundamentally have to get comfortable with and you will get more comfortable with. It's like a muscle, like the more uncertainty and risk and chaos that you expose yourself to, you will actually develop a tougher shell or a higher capacity to deal with it. So if that's something that you're genuinely trying to do and you're like, wow, this is really uncomfortable. This is like, I'm stepping out of the stream and like going this other direction. It will become easier to stomach and you'll, you'll find yourself more capable of handling that stress and that chaos as you dive further into it. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Sure thing. Both of you. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything we can do for you? As a last question. Nah. <laughs> is, it extra, is it extra likes on Facebook? No. That's cheesy to ask for. Um, go, <laughs> go be kind to someone in the next 24 hours. Not. I mean, it couldn't be a friend that you just haven't been kind to, but like preferably someone else. Like, un, no affiliation, no reason. Go be kind to someone, whatever that means to you.